Let's turn to the Lord. Immediately he picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Our Father, we pray this morning that we would see Jesus. I pray that you would remove me out of the way by the power of the Holy Spirit and that our gaze would be Jesus. I pray for anyone here who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ that they too would see Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning and welcome once again. Um, I am sending a lot of greetings and love from your church family at Christ Church in Mshanga. Uh, they sent me along and when uh, Pastor Goodenough offered me the opportunity to come and preach for you, they said, please do send our greetings to your church. So please receive those greetings. I've done my job, right? Faithfully. They do send their love and their greetings to you. We love Pastor Goodenough. I am convinced Pastor Goodenough is one of the finest preachers in Africa. And I'm really struggling to, to know what I am doing here as a result. I'm trying to figure that one out. I mean, you've got the finest right here who preaches for you week in and week out. And he's one of the finest, not because he's got a wonderful voice. He's one of the finest because he preaches the gospel. The difference between great preaching in our world and society and faithful preaching is that which preaches the gospel. It's as simple as that, folks. Uh, public speaking is not what Jesus asked for. You've got many of those people outside in the world. What the Lord Jesus Christ asked for was faithfulness. Tell them what I told you. Do you get it? And that's why your, your pastor is one of the finest, if not our continent in our world today. You ought to cherish him and thank God for people like that. As I'm telling you now, there are many a pulpits this morning that are not preaching Jesus. And it's a sad affair. With that, I'm going to ask a favor and a deal. Can we strike a deal right at the beginning of the sermon? Please keep your Bible open in front of you. The only way you can track with me in this service and sermon is if you're looking at your Bible, not me. Uh, I did joke that I'm good looking, but actually I'm not. The truth is the Word of God is much more effective and powerful. So if your heads are down, that means I'm doing a great job. We live in a world that is fractured at every level, don't we? from family and international relations, it seems hard to make and maintain harmony. Every day the news feeds and papers tell stories of broken relationships, strife-ridden communities, and warring nations, just like Ethiopia, as we can see in our news, Eswatini, as we've seen. Why is our world like this? Well, I suspect that there are as many answers to that question as there are people in this room. Some would say, well, if we can just get a new government, sort out the municipalities as we tried to do, do last week, uh, when was it, Monday, we went to the polls. Well, only then we will remake or restore the world. Uh, some would say, well, we need to eradicate poverty and educate everyone, right? And it might be that the brokenness of our world is something you feel very deeply this morning as you come to worship with God's people, perhaps a relationship that has caused heartache for years is what you're thinking about, or the sickness you're battling with. And you're wondering, why is it so difficult to find harmony in our relationships, in our bodies, 
in this seemingly God-forsaken world. Well, friends, it's important for us to come back to the Word of God as we ask those questions. For in it, we find enormous clarity as to why the world is as it is. The Bible makes clear that the world is a broken place because people in it are alienated from the living God who made it. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden, if you read Genesis 1 all the way to chapter 3. And it's been happening ever since, this alienation between people and God. The greatest war, Billy Graham once said, at play in our world today is not Iraq. It's not between husbands and wives countries and countries to see who has the biggest muscles. It is between God and man. That is the greatest war at play today. Humans, uh, humans have broken away from God's loving rule and ha they've decided to live without it in reference to the God who made it. And yet, the God who made it is so gracious, isn't he? He's so generous that he's not given up in this world. In fact, as we speak, he's at, he's at work to restore and remake his world. How, you say? Well, here is a Bible story before us of how God is remaking, restoring, fixing his world. Never mind action essay, fix South Africa. God is fixing this world. And this story before us we have today teaches us the, some of the greatest truths in the Bible. I'm sure you heard, if you've been to Sunday school, you've had the privilege of going to Sunday school from the age of Sunday school. And the main point of this Bible passage is very, very simple. But don't mistake the simplicity for its profundity. It's deep. Just because it's simple doesn't mean it's not weighty and deep and profound. Here it is. Jesus has the authority to give us what we really need through the forgiveness of sins. Did you catch that? I like the sound of that. I'm going to play it again for you. Jesus has the authority to give us what we really, really need through the forgiveness of sins. And here's, here's our game plan, our flight plan for, for the sermon. Here it is. Number one, he's going to show us there's a shock in this passage. That's verses one to seven. And number two, we're going to see the solution of this passage, all driving us to see with great Holy Spirit-empowered clarity that Jesus has the authority to give us what we really need through the forgiveness of sins. You all buckled up? Let's take the flight. Number one, the shock. The shock. Uh, Jesus, in verse 1, has come home to Capernaum, not far from Lake Galilee. You see it there in verse 1. Please look at your Bibles, not me. It's a small village. But news, is, news of Jesus' miracles has caused a commotion that would rival that of the Durban Central Business District. The people of the area have discovered that Jesus is a miracle worker. Not the ones you see on TBN who need stage props and who steal people's money. No, we're talking about the real deal. The previous story versus, if you look at, if you glance at chapter uh, 1, verse 40 to 45, that story has borne evidence to the fact that Jesus healed a man who had leprosy, a skin disease. And the Bible says that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town because people were coming to him from every quarter. And now, chapter 2, verse 1, after some days, perhaps some weeks, 
No sooner are we told that he's come home that we are told that people caught wind of Jesus' arrival at home. What do you think they want from Jesus? To be healed. And Mark tells us in verse 2 that many gathered that such there was, that there was no more room left in the house. And we're not surprised, verse 2, that Jesus is on mission. Do you see it? He's still preaching. It's wonderful, isn't it? The Lord is still, people want to use him for healing, but he's still focused on preaching. What was the subject of his preach? Well, you need chapter 1 for that. Come to chapter 1, verse 14. Here's the subject of his preach. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. In other words, he was teaching them the gospel of the great kingdom of God. He was telling them that in me, Jesus, the kingdom of God has dawned. He was teaching them that the new world that they were waiting for and longing for had arrived by his entry into the world, as we will celebrate this Christmas. And we know that Jesus was serious about, about the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom because if you come to chapter 1, verse 38, he tells us that, right? Do you see it? And he said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came. Very clear, isn't it? In other words, the miracles that Jesus performed were secondary in Jesus' mind because his priority was to preach, proclaim the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. Now, that's an easy application point, isn't it? A, a, a church that claims to follow this Jesus and does not place the pulpit at the center of what it does is a church that has lost its focus, is a church that has forgotten its main priority. What do you have to give Pine Town? The proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. That's what you have. And we get it from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. While Jesus was preaching, it was a packed house. You see it, verse 3? Verse 2 and 3. And then verse 3, four men decide to bring their paralyzed friend to Jesus. But Mark says they were met by an obstacle along the way because of the crowds. You see it, verse 3? And so they changed tact. They made another plan. Uh, not an easier plan. They decided to get their friend to Jesus via an opening in the roof of the house. And there they laid him down in full view of them all. You can imagine as Jesus was speaking, and suddenly in the roof, a man descends on a, on a pallet, being dropped down in full view of them all, completely derailing our Lord from what he's saying, and completely distracting the people who are listening to what Jesus is saying. Thankfully, this doesn't happen much, does it, does it Pastor Goodenough, at Pine Town? I'll tell you, friends, we, we had a situation in our church a couple of years ago. Uh, we had a wonderful brother who had epilepsy, and he was at church the one occasion. And this brother's a lovely Christian brother. He's just sick. That's all, epilepsy. And uh, it was just that day where he, the Lord decided to allow him to have a fit. And it was a church. I tell you, the sermon could not continue. Chairs were rustling and bustling all over. People scared. We had to stop the sermon. And it, we had to ease people and say, listen, it's okay. We know him. We love him. He's part of our church family. He just has ep epilepsy, and this is a fit. Let the doctors, thankfully, we had doctors in the service who could help and come to his aid. But I, I, I tell you what I won't uh, forget. We had a couple of ladies who were praying and casting out demons upon him. 
Can you imagine that? And we had to teach him, no, 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 this is a friend of ours. He belongs to this church, and actually he's got a, a case of epilepsy, and, that, and that's all it is. Relax. And that, you, as you can imagine, uh, sparked up a lot of pastoral issues that Monday morning after. Because we had to follow up those ladies. Do you really think you can cast out demons? <laughs> but anyway, a, a scene like this just derails the whole thing, right? People cannot hear the sermon anymore if something like this happens. But Mark wants to show us that that's not the real shocker. Have a look at verse 5. The real shocker comes in what Jesus says to the man. Do you see it, verse 5? Am I reading my Bible correctly? Jesus recognized the friends in their faith, which led the man to Jesus for healing at great cost. We've got that. But this is now part of the story where it's like a movie where the music slows right down. The tension is heightened. And Jesus, the main characters are almost eyeballing. Jesus is eyeballing this paralytic man. The crowds are watching and we are, as readers are expecting Jesus to heal the man, right? And then Jesus says, do you see, read your Bible, verse 5, son, your sins are forgiven. Dad, I want my money back. Jeez, what a, sh- what a charlatan Jesus is. What was everyone expecting? Healing. Look at what Jesus says, verse 5, your sins are forgiven. Now that is a shock, isn't it? That is a shock of note. Was Jesus not aware of the plight of paralytics in his day? They had no social standing. Literally, they couldn't stand because they were paralyzed. They had no prospects of lucrative employment. So, and so, look after a family. They couldn't work. They were paralyzed. What they really needed was Jesus to heal, was Jesus to heal this man. It seems, it seems rather insensitive of Jesus, isn't it? Verse 5. And you can also imagine the, 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 the bewilderment of the friends and the crowds who are waiting to see yet another death touch miracle from the Lord Jesus Christ, but Jesus shocks them all. Literally, he says, child. It's, in the original, it's, it's the word child, technon. Child, your sins are forgiven. He endears himself to him. I mean, Jesus, come on. You can't be serious. There is no suggestion in this text that the man's sickness was a result of his sins, right? We must be careful of that teaching. In fact, in the next story, if you look at verse 13, to 17, Levi, who's, who's also known as Matthew, he was a tax collector. And in Jesus' day, tax collectors were no different to the immoral and corrupt extortionists of our day. In other words, the text, the text it gives you something to pinpoint in that section, verses 13 to 17. There is a clear sinner, he's a tax collector, he's like a Shabir Sheikh. <clears throat> Moving on. It's very clear. Do you see it? So that is the man I expect Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven, right? But he says it to a paralyzed man who hasn't done, there's no evidence that he's done anything wrong. That maybe the only fault of the man was to allow his friends to let him down on the roof and disturb Jesus from talking. But according to the Bible, that's not a sin. So what on earth is happening here? I'm gl- I really am glad you asked. Jesus is taking the opportunity to highlight the man's greatest need. Do you see it? What they looked for was healing. Jesus has come to deal with the deepest human need. And it's not always apparent. When I look at you right now, I cannot 
always readily see what you need deeply. Jesus can. We so often think we can understand what we need, right? What do you think your deepest need is this morning? What do you really need this morning? Or Jesus would say, a healthy body, secure housing in a bank account, and yet a sick soul is not to be coveted. I've come to give you something far deeper, far greater, far searching. But in case you're thinking, well, Jesus doesn't care about his physical body, well, he does, because at the end of the story, he heals a man, right? So he actually does care about his physical body, but he says there's something deeper when it comes to human beings that they need. Our human predicament is alienation from God. That's our biggest problem. We are separated from God because of sin. And therefore, our human need is reconciliation to the same, our Lord God. How does that happen? Through the wonderful pronouncement of verse 5, the forgiveness of your sins. Has that happened to you? Have you been forgiven your sins deeply, genuinely? We live in an age where people don't pay attention to sin, right? Uh, we downplay the word sin these days. Uh, we glibly say we are all sinners, but we don't understand the horror of sin. Uh, Maybe, ladies, eating another piece of chocolate you call sinful. Because there's a waistline, you know, the problem's the waist. You know what I'm, yeah, okay, moving on. Or in sport, gentlemen, in sport, what, what happened yesterday is the Springboks played. They went into, someone went into the sin bin. You see how we downplay sin? That's not what sin is. If you shove Etzebeth, and go into a bin and you sit down for 10 minutes. Is that sin? Really? Come on, man. Stop playing games. But to God, sin is the breaking of his laws. Sin is the stain in our hearts that leaves, that leads to all the evil actions we see on our newspapers if you buy them today. Sin is the failure to worship God but to replace God in our lives with something else, perhaps family, friends, money, sex, and making huge sacrifices for those things. But you know what? It never satisfies our souls. We know that. And here's the problem with sin. It keeps us away from the kingdom of God, the world we really, really, really want. The world of harmony, of peace, no more tears. You know that world that, that John in the Apocalypse and Revelation talks about? That world. You know what keeps us from that world? Sin. That alienates us from the living God who loves us. So what Jesus is doing is to say that everyone in the room... All those reading Mark's Gospel chapter 2 today, you are sin. That's what he's saying. You are sin, and you need your sin forgiven. The greatest need you have today, as you sit, is your sins forgiven. And I'm the only one who has the authority to do that, says Jesus. That's the implication of verse 5. And you can imagine how that would have landed with the people in that day, and I know how that lands with the people of our day. People don't want to hear a message like that. People don't want to hear you talk about sin. Perhaps the people in that day were dejected and disappointed with Jesus. That's what happens when you preach the gospel, right? There's a power in the gospel. Oh, now he's going deeper than just superficial levels. And it touches a heart, a nerve with us that we don't like. 
That's what Jesus does. But the plot thickens as they say, notice verse 6, read with me verse 6 to 7. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. You see that, that heart word? He's touched their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? The scribes were the religious theologians and experts in the law of God's, of that day. And they were checking Jesus out to see if he, his claims were in line with what the Old Testament had said. So they were just doing their job. They were doing a good job. They should be doing this. They were absolutely right when they say, only God can forgive sin. Remember Psalm 103 verse 2. Beautiful words. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Do you remember that? And that is said of the living God, not the Lord Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So they write about that. Only God can forgive sins. But they are wrong to say that Jesus, what, what else do they say about Jesus? They say he's blaspheming. Do you see it? He's insulting God. He's casting contempt on the living God of the Old Testament as they knew him. And the reason they are wrong is because they think that Jesus is just a man from Nazareth, like most people in Pinetown think today. Just a man. Just a man. No significance. In fact, this is one of the main accusations that led them to crucify Jesus. He's, blas he's a blasphemer when he was held court at his crucifixion. You see, by claiming to forgive the man's sin, what Jesus is saying, to my, is saying about himself is that he is none other than the living God. This is God in the flesh. Because Jesus, unlike the Old Testament prophets, does not say, the Lord, God, forgive your sins, child. What does he say? Child, your sins are forgiven. As if the man's sins were against Jesus. Which they were, because he's God. You see, friends, Jesus has the authority to give us what we need through the forgiveness of sins. If, we saw, if Jesus saw right through the man's greatest need, the scribes here see, saw right through what Jesus said to the man. And that leads to the second thing I want to show you this morning, the solution. Verses 6 to 7 seem to be a bit of an impasse, uh, needing some kind of solution or resolution in the story. And I think we get that in verses 8 to 12, the solution. Have a look at verse 8. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? There's the hard word again. Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up, take your bed, and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. Mark is giving you hints that Jesus is God. Do you notice one of the things he can do? He can perceive what you're thinking in your heart. Do you see it? He perceived what they're thinking in their hearts. And then he asked them one of the most brilliant questions ever asked in the Gospels. Here is Mark's irony. Which is easier to say, that's the key word, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your mat, and walk? Which is easier, friends? Which is easier to say, says Jesus to them. Well, it's easier to say that your sins are forgiven to the man because you can't prove it. You got that? It's easy. It's harder to say to a man or a woman, rise, take up your mat and walk because if it doesn't happen, you're a charlatan. You got that? That's his logic. That's Jesus' logic. Jesus would have been happy to forgive the guy and move on. But the scribes are thinking some, they are doubting who Jesus is, basically, in their hearts. 
And then Jesus says to the doubtful scribes, verse 10, well, I did this. I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Do you see it? It comes twice in, in the gospel. And then he heals the man in verse 11. So Jesus did care about his physical needs. Rise, get up, take your mat, and walk. You can be sure that when he says the easier thing, your sins are forgiven, it is actually done because he did the thing that was harder to say. He proved it. He evidenced it to them. Notice what Jesus calls himself. Do you see it? Verse, uh, verse 10. He calls himself the son of man. You see it? It comes from the prophecy in uh, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, where before God, one like the son of man, it's judgment day. The books are open. And this son of man approaches the ancient of days, the living God. And God gives him the kingdom, the authority to rule, the authority to reign over all the kingdoms of our world. Friends, a man is going to be king of all kings when judgment day comes. That man is the son of man, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that son of man now, he says very clearly, verse 10, has authority to forgive your sins. In other words, to get you to heaven, to get you into that new world, to get you into the world where there will be no more pain, no more felt needs, no more strife, no more relational issues between husbands and wives. No more warring nations. To get into that world, what do you need? The forgiveness of your sins. By whom? The Son of Man. The Lord Jesus Christ. That's verse 10. He did the miracle to show that the forgiveness of sins comes from the Son of Man in power. Who can forgive sins? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, what will you say to God when you meet him one day? Your money will, will not be of use to him. What will you say before God when you meet him one day? What you really need from him is forgiveness of your sins. Forgiveness for your deceit. I'm glad we prayed the prayer of confession today, brother. Forgiveness for the cover-ups, the competitiveness the joy, you know how we have joy in ourselves at other people's failures? That needs to be forgiven. Because that's against God. You know how we put other people down behind their backs? That needs to be forgiven. Because that is sin against God. How will you face a holy God one day when you die? That is what matters most. You've got to have your sins forgiven. You've got, you've got to meet him as one who is known and loved by him because you've had your sins forgiven in this life by the Son of Man. Are your sins forgiven? If they're not, we'd love to help you with that. Please come speak to Pastor Goodenough after the service. Come and chat to me. I'd love to help with that. Have a look at verse 17. I'm trying to drive this, home, this point home here. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but whom? It's very plain in the black and white. Sorry, mine is the red and white. In other words, if you don't think you are sin, Jesus doesn't need you. It's not for you. You might as well just rescind your membership. Go and do what, go to the beach, have coffee, live your life, be merry. Jesus is not for you if you do not think that you are sin and you need the forgiveness of your sins from the Lord Jesus Christ. You see it? It's clear, isn't it? I preached a sermon in Cape Town, at a church in Cape Town a few years ago, and a wonderful old lady, Christian lady, came up to me after the service. 
and said to me, Sinan, I wouldn't hurt an ant. I'm not a sinner. And I said, I had to say to you politely, Ma, I didn't know from a bar soap, Ma, well, isn't that nice? But Jesus thinks you're a sinner. Does it get more clearer than that, folks? Verse 17, he's not come to call the righteous, that is, those who are self-made men and women. Those who are self-righteous, who stand on their own morality, whether it's cultural or from work, or you learn from parents, doesn't matter. He's come to call people who are sinners. So if you're a sinner today, you qualify for Jesus. If you're a sinner today, you qualify for Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? He's a friend of sinners. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. But you preach that message in our world today, you empty your church, right? Because what do people want? They want to make themselves. I did it my way. I built my family. I built my finances. Jesus says, well, you have no need for my kingdom. I've not come for you. Crushing words from the Lord Jesus Christ, but liberating words, because when you are forgiven, isn't it wonderful to be known and loved by the Lord Jesus Christ? Have a look at, I'm going to read here uh, Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Here, here's a, I think Paul was reflecting on Mark's gospel. Colossians 1, chapter, uh, 1 cha verse 13 to 14, he says, For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And brought us into the kingdom, there's the language of Mark, the kingdom of the son he loves, that's Jesus, in whom we have redemption, in case you didn't understand it, then Paul says, the forgiveness of sins. You see it? It's beautiful. We've been moved from a realm of darkness. If you are not a Christian here today, you are in the realm of darkness. But you need not be despaired because the Lord Jesus Christ has come to get you out. If you would acknowledge your sin before him and accept his gracious, generous, kind forgiveness. In Mark's gospel, Jesus is heading, you know this, he's heading where? To the cross. Because forgiveness comes at great cost to himself where he was wounded, do you remember Isaiah? He was wounded for our transgressions, where he bore the punishment that, that sin deserves so that men and women who trust in him might enjoy the grace that they don't deserve because of the Lord Jesus Christ. The cross, friends, is central to what we speak, what we proclaim. Jesus died a painful and excruciating death to forgive us our sins as we will celebrate at the Lord's table now. He shed his blood. He proved that the cross had worked by rising again from the grave. Do you remember? And then he rose to the clouds so that as the, the evangelist in Acts says, no, there is no other name on earth by which we can find forgiveness. Others may teach great things, the philosophers of our age, doesn't matter. Others may do great things, go into the moon like Elon Musk is trying to do, doesn't matter. You know what the problem with Elon Musk is? He can't get close to God. You can go to the moon, but you're not going to get close to God. You need forgiveness. That's how you get close to God. Only one man can do that. And notice how Mark ends the story. I love how he ends the story. Who did they glorify because of this miracle? Interesting, they don't glorify Jesus. They glorify whom? It says God. In other words, they recognize that in what Jesus had done, God was present. God was there. And so they glorified his name. Very clear. It's beautiful, isn't it? 
Why? Because Jesus has the authority as the Son of Man to give us what we really need today through the forgiveness of our sins. Do you know this forgiveness? You might say to me, yes, I do. Well, why do you, ex- why do you fail to extend it if you know it? Someone who's been forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ, who does not extend forgiveness to others, may not yet know what that forgiveness is like, right? If you understood what your forgiveness means, Christian, why do you lack assurance of your salvation? Who forgives sin? Is it you? Does it depend on how much you've read your Bible? How many services you've attended? It can't be. Who who has the authority to forgive sins? Jesus. So so I need to disempower you today. (laughs) Power does not reside in you and what you do for the Lord Jesus Christ. Power resides in the one who went to the cross to forgive us our sins. So you can be assured because of a past action of God, not a present failure of yours. That your sins are forgiven. Isn't that beautiful? I really thought you'd be smiling at that point. That is tremendous. God loves the ungodly. And I am prime example of that. If you knew that your sins were forgiven, you would recognize that man-made religion is opposed to the gospel. Religion and the gospel are not friends, they are enemies. Religion says, I will do, I will do, I will do. The gospel says, it's done, it's done, it's done. It's beautiful. And so I am glad, church, that my sins are forgiven, are you? I am glad that the Son of Man has come for us, are you? I am glad, church, that what I really need has been satisfied by Christ, are you? Now will you pray with me? I'm going to give you a moment before I pray. Perhaps you want to say something to the Lord for yourself. Perhaps you want to thank him. Ask him for more forgiveness for the sins that linger. Perhaps you want to say to him, I've forgotten. I've forgotten how free and gracious your forgiveness is. Say what you need to say to the Lord and I'll pray. Heavenly Father, nothing... In our hands, we bring simply to thy cross, we cling. Would you help us, empower us by the Spirit to believe that only Jesus has the authority to forgive sins and and thus give us what we really need. For his sake we pray. Amen.